So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about an Omega level commander. And Omega level commanders are commanders that are incredibly powerful and they are massive threats. And the Omega level commander that we're going to be talking about on this episode is Miram Sentinel Worm. Miram is a 6-6 dragon spirit with flying in ward 2 that costs 3 green, blue, red. It says, whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a token that's a copy of it, except the token isn't legendary if that dragon is legendary. This commander is absolutely absurd and most definitely did not need that extra protection with that ward too, but it is there, so yeah, that definitely adds to the power level on this one. Just being a 6-6 flying drag with some built-in protection is great, and of course, on top of that, an absolutely incredible and in many ways overpowered effect that doubles up on every single one of your dragons for just entering the battlefield. This does not specify if you cast it. It doesn't say, hey, if a dragon enters the battlefield and you cast it, create a token copy of it. No, 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 no. This does not specify that. This is any kind of dragon entering the battlefield under your control. So, of course, there are plenty of ways for us to use and abuse that, and we'll talk about some of those here in a bit. But, yeah, also on top of that, this allows you to have your legendary creatures double up as well, and it makes the token not legendary. And with the token not being legendary, of course, there are ways to use and abuse that as well to make even more non-legendary legendary dragons, if you know what I mean. And of course, although we only have access to three of the colors, you know, versus a typical, you know, dragon tribal deck might have access to all five, there are still some incredibly powerful dragons in these colors. And yeah, with an effect like this one, it's probably a good thing that this is not a five color commander because it would be even more absurd. Now, with this deck tech, every single card, including the commander, is less than $1. So we have a very budget friendly deck. And of course, you can find the deck list link in the description below. So if you're interested in building this deck, make sure you check that out. On top of that, I'm going to be taking you through different tactics to show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. And now with all that said, let's jump into it. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, and my goodness, that feel good to say again. And yeah, this is currently now a 60 cent card, so still within budget territory. And actually, previously it was around 30 to 40 to 50 cents, so hopefully it doesn't just keep, you know, skyrocketing in price. Or hopefully they keep reprinting it so it stays budget. But of course, in green, we've got access to other great lame ramp cards like Fun Fertility, Search for Tomorrow, Grow from the Ashes, Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, Skirt Tribe Builder, Edge of Autumn, and Rampant Growth. So we're going to be utilizing those as well. Moving on, we've also got some dragon specific ramp with cards like Dragon's Horde, Nimble Claw Adept, and Savage Vent Maw. Dragon's Horde says, whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde, and we can tap to remove a gold counter from it to draw a card, or tap to add one man of any color. So this is a mana rock that can help us with either ramping, or with card advantage as well. And then next up, we've got Nimbleclaw Depth, which can tap to untap two other target permanents, activating only as a sorcery and only once each turn. Regardless, this basically pays for itself, because again, with our commander, we get a token copy of this, so then we can tap each of them to untap four permanents. And obviously that's just extra mana value over time, and yeah, that can get really absurd. And speaking of absurd, there's Savage Vent Maul, which has whenever it attacks, add red, 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 green, 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 until an attorney don't lose this mana, steps and phases end. And again, with that copy that's made by our commander, we are not only getting that six mana, but six from the token as well. When it attacks, that's 12 mana that we get each turn we attack with these from a six mana card. Now, as good as these cards are, there's still one, in my opinion, that stands above the rest, and that would be the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of 99. And the golden pick for this deck is Ganax Astral Hunter. It's a 3-4 dragon with flying that costs 4 in a red that says whenever it or another dragon enters the battlefield under control, create a treasure token. So when we play this with our commander in play, again, our commander does not care if a creature is legendary. It says, hey, sure, you get a token copy of this that is not legendary, so you can have two of them. Awesome. So just by playing this 5 mana card, we are already getting 2 mana back again by getting 2 treasure tokens. But that's just the start, because again, with two copies in play, whenever any dragon enters the battlefield, we get two treasure tokens. So from now on, again, when we play a dragon, say we get a token copy of it, that's two dragons coming into play, giving us four treasures in total. Things can get really out of hand with this, and yeah, this is really absurd, and there's some very broken things that we can do with this, and yeah, there's a reason why this is the golden pig of this deck.
Moving on though, now that we've talked about ramp, let's talk about ways to generate card advantage, and of course there are plenty of dragons that can help us with that. First up, there's Furkrog, which is a flying hasty dragon that says, whenever one or more dragons you control attack an opponent, go dark creature that player controls. And whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, if that creature had to attack this combat, you put a plus one counter on Furkrog and you draw a card. So this can force our opponents to attack each other a ton and give us a lot of card advantage for doing so. And again, I'm not going to mention this on every single dragon that I bring up, but yeah, we get a token copy of it. So have fun doubling up each of those things. Next up, there's Nimbus at the Fire Mine, which can tap the draw a card. And whenever we draw a card, it's going to deal one damage to any target. And speaking of Nimbizit, we also have Nimbizit, but this time Draco Genius. Whenever he deals combat to a player, you may draw a card, and by paying blue-red, it's going to ping something for one. Each of these can draw us a ton of cards throughout the game and dish out a lot of damage. Speaking of which, we've got Imrith Desert Doom, a 5-5 dragon with flying that has Ward 4 as long as it's untapped, and whenever he deals combat to a player, we draw a card, and if we've got fewer than three cards in hand, we draw cards equal to the difference. Next up, there's Skyline Despot, which has Ventures the Battlefield to become the Monarch at the beginning of your upkeep. If you're the Monarch, you get a 5-5 red dragon creature talking with flying. So this can provide us a lot of card advantage throughout the game and make us an absurd amount of tokens. And speaking of card advantage, there's Dream Pillager, which can help us out with a lot of temporary card advantage. Whenever it deals combat to a player, exile that many cards in the top of your library. Until end of turn, you may cast spells from among those exiled cards. And generally with flying, we're going to be able to get through on at least one opponent with this. And the token copy of it. But another dragon that helps out in a different way is Draconic Muralist, which has, whenever it dies, you may search your life for a dragon card, reveal it, put in your hand, then shuffle. Basically, this is a double tutor in this deck for dragons. Moving on, there's Coralessa, which says you may look at the top card of your library anytime you may cast dragon cells in the top of your library. This kind of card advantage can add up a lot throughout the game. But a different kind of card advantage comes from Backdraft Hellkite, which is a 4-4 flyer that has, when it attacks, each instant sorcerer card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost equal to its mana cost. So this can basically help us recast all of our instants and sorceries, and believe me, there are some instants and sorceries that we'll get to here in a bit that can be disgusting with this. And speaking of disgusting, we've got even more ways to draw a ton of cards with cards like Garrick's Uprising, Return of the Wild Speaker, and Shamanic Revelation. Garrick's Uprising has, when it enters the battlefield, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, draw a card. Creatures you control have trample. Whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. So, first up, immediate card advantage on this is nice. Creatures you control have trample is a great way to get a ton of damage through. And of course, that last part is absolutely absurd. Again, essentially, the vast majority of our dragons are going to be drawing us two cards when they come into play because of the token copy of them. Next up, there's Return of the Wild Speaker, which can help us out in one of two ways. It says, choose one, draw cards, deal the greatest power among non-human creatures you control, and non-human creatures you control get plus three, plus three until end of turn. So this can help us draw a lot of cards or help be a great finisher as well. And finally, there's Shamanic Revelation, which is going to draw a card for each creature we control, and we gain four life for each creature we control, or power four or greater. So draw a ton of cards, gain a ton of life, what's not to love? Moving on though, another fantastic aspect of this deck are clones. For example, clone, the original clone, go figure. You may have it into the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. So essentially, whatever our best dragon is, now we get two more copies of that dragon. And like I mentioned earlier, say that's one of our legendary dragons, well, we can actually copy that as long as we're copying the token copy that is not legendary. So yeah, this can get out of control very quickly. And of course, we've got plenty of clones to pick from. I mean, Mirror Image is another great one that just costs three mana and can enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature we control. And speaking of three mana, there's Protein Raider, which can enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield if we attack with a creature this turn. Regardless of which clone we are using, though, these can all be very impactful. So, of course, we're going to be running even more like Undercover Operative, which is going to enter the battlefield as any creature on the battlefield, except it enters with a shield counter on it if we control that creature. Or how about Altered Ego, which can't be countered, and it's going to enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield with an additional X plus one counters on it. Next up, there's Mercurial Pretender, which might cost one more, but we can utilize that creature multiple times by bouncing it back to our hand. So by paying two blue blue, we can bounce Mercurial Pretender back to our hand, and yeah, we get to keep that creature token clone in play. Next up, there's Mario the Frost, which can enter the battlefield as a copy of any permanent we control, except it's legendary and so with other types, and if it's a creature, it comes into play with two additional plus one counters on it. And then Vesuvian Shapeshifter can actually switch from creature to creature. When it enters the battlefield or is turned face up, we can choose another creature on the battlefield, and until it's turned face down, it comes a copy of that creature, except it has. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may turn this creature 
face down. Which we can, of course, morph back up for one in a blue. And finally, we're also going to be running Molten Echoes, which has, when it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, so obviously dragons. Whenever a non-token dragon of the chosen type enters the battlefield on your control, create a token that's a copy of that creature. That token gains haste. Exile at the beginning of the next 10 step. So this one might only make us temporary token versions of creatures, but still that can be an incredibly powerful thing. Especially with some of our dragons' ETBs. And speaking of ETBs... My goodness, Blink cards are effective with this commander with cards like Essence Flux, Siren's Ruse, and Planner Incision. Essence Flux, just for one mana, is going to help us exile one of our creatures and bring it back to the battlefield under our control. Again, because our commander does not specify that a creature into the battlefield had to be cast to get that trigger, we can just Blink one of our dragons, you know, one of our non-token dragons, and get an additional copy on that ETB. On top of whatever other ETB triggers we might have. Siren's Ruse essentially does the exact same thing but for 2 mana, and Planar Incision can exile an artifact or a creature, and it comes back to play with an initial counter on it. Regardless, these are essentially ways that can protect our creatures from target removal, and also fantastic ways to just get an extra token copy for very cheap. So of course we'll also be running Teferi's Time Twist, which can blink any of our permanents and bring it back at the beginning of the next 10 step. Or how about Blur, which can blink a creature we control and draw us a card on top of that. So some nice extra value there. And speaking of extra value, well, we can blink even more things with Ghostly Flicker, Displace, and the Distragium, which can each blink two creatures. Ghostly Flicker can actually blink a combination of artifacts, creatures, and or lands, but yeah, most of the time, creatures are going to be most effective. And while Lusion Stratagem can only target creatures, well, it's going to have us draw us a card as well. Regardless, two extra copies of two of our dragons for just three or four mana, yeah, sign me up for that. And speaking of extra copies, well, we're also going to be running Selesnia Uologist, which has pay two and a green, exile target creature card from a graveyard, then populate. And populating, of course, means we get to create a token that's a copy of a creature token we control. So it's a fantastic repeatable effect that can help us make an absurd amount of token copies. And believe me, there are some tokens that we are really going to want copies of. First up, how about Lozan Dragon's Legacy, which has whenever you cast an adventure spell or a dragon spell, Lozan Dragon's Legacy deals damage you. That spell's mana value to any target that isn't a commander. This can dish out a lot of pain throughout the game. Speaking of which, Scourge of Alkis, this one is really absurd. Whenever it or the dragon enters the battlefield under control, it deals X damage to any target or X the number of dragons you control. Again, you will get two copies of this thanks to your commander. And obviously, you've got other ways to make even more copies to make this even more absurd. But yeah, whenever any dragon comes into play, again, you're getting a second copy of it with your commander and you get double the damage from your Scourge of Alcuses. Moving on, how about Vengeful Ancestor? Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, go target creature. Whenever a go to creature attacks, it deals one damage to its controller. And speaking of creature removal, there's Demanding Dragon, which has whenever it enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target opponent unless that player sacrifices a creature. And speaking of damage, there's about Guardian Hellkite. Whenever it enters the battlefield, it deals five damage divided as you choose among any number of targets. With that token copy, and again with this being a flash speed creature, that is going to be pretty brutal. And speaking of Brutal, there's Kaga the Tithe Star, which has, when it dies, gain control of target creature. And yet another Dragon Spear that's very effective in this deck is Ryusai, which says, whenever it dies, deals 5 damage to each creature without flying. So this can be a fantastic one-sided board wipe in many situations for us. Speaking of which, there's Thunder Dragon, which has, whenever it enters the battlefield, deals 3 damage to each creature without flying. Which, of course, we get to double up on, so goodbye pretty much all of our opponent's creatures that don't have flying. Next up, another dragon that can take out a massive number of things at once is Steel Hellkite, which has pay X, destroy each non and permanent converted mana cost X, whose controller was dealt damage by Steel Hellkite this turn, activate this ability only once each turn. Next up, though, a non-dragon removal spell, we've got Aether Gale, which is going to bounce six target non and permanents back to their owner's hands. Keep in mind, sometimes bouncing our own dragons might be a good call, because, yeah, we can really abuse their ETBs and get even more copies of them. Next up, though, a creature that is technically a dragon, let's talk about Masked Vandal, it has Changeling, so yeah, it's every creature type, and when it enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard, if you do, exile target artifact or enchantment opponent controls. So we get to double up on that effect. And then we've got Return to Nature, which is a solid removal spell, destroy target artifact or target enchantment or exile target card from a graveyard and beast then a very good removal spell destroy target permanent its control creates a 3-3 green beast creature token good luck to that beast doing anything with our massive dragon army moving on we've got negate which can counter target non-creature spell and sapphire dragon which can also counter target non-creature spell with the adventure psionic pulse on top of that when it is in play it's a 5-6 dragon that has whenever attacks or blocks scry 2. Finally, there's Thunderbreak Regent, which makes it incredibly difficult for our opponents to ever justify trying to target our dragons, because it says, whenever a dragon you control becomes the target of a spell or ability the opponent controls, Thunderbreak Regent deals three damage to that player, which of course is going to be double with the token copy, so good luck to them.
But finally, we've got some really heavy hitters that can help our team hit incredibly hard with Terror Mount Velus, Atarka World Render, and Thrakus the Butcher. Terror Mount Velus is a 5 5 with flying and double strike that has, when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain double strike until end of turn. Atarka is a 6 4 flying and trample, and it says, whenever a dragon you control attacks, it gains double strike until end of turn. Yeah, double strike on our double dragon army is going to be incredibly deadly. Speaking of which, there's Thrakus the Butcher, which is a 3 4 dragon peasant with trample that has, whenever it attacks, double the power of each dragon you control until end of turn. This is absurd. Again, we get a token copy that isn't legendary of it thanks to our commander. So we get both of those attack triggers, doubling the power of our creatures once and then twice. And even with just our commander as an example, that is a six power creature that goes to 12 and then to 24, which of course is a one shot KO on any of our opponents. So yeah, I mean, all of these can be incredibly impactful and can really help us finish out a game. But now that we've talked about every single nine lane card in this deck, let's talk about the price. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, every single card in this deck, including the commander, is less than $1, so our estimated cost comes in at $34.04. And actually, that does include basic lands at $0.10 cents a piece, so you might be able to save even more if you've already got those. And speaking of extra savings, you might be able to save even more by buying this deck on TCG Player and utilizing heavily played and damaged cards, which of course need a home too. Though, do keep in mind that this estimated cost does not include the cost of shipping, which might vary depending upon where you live. And with that, the show has come to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support.